morning as we are diving into God's Word today for our Bible study. We're continuing our journey through Romans. We're going to be talking about being saved. Uh, we're going to pick up at Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 15 for this lesson. And remember, when we get started, I want to make sure you have your Bible, make sure you have something to write with, and make sure you have something to write on. So whether that's a journal or a notebook, just go grab something. Maybe it's the personal study guide uh, that should be sent out with this video as well. If you'll grab that, download it. Uh, hit pause, go get all the supplies that you need, and when you come back, hit play, and we'll be ready to dive into the Bible study. As we get started, what are some practical ways to gain favor with your family? What are some practical ways to gain favor with your family, your friends, your coworkers, or your boss? What's some ways that you can gain favor with them? And, uh, you know, as I look at it, as long as you're you feed your kids the right stuff, make sure they get their dessert. You can make them happy for a while, right? Uh, if, you're, if you're doing what you're supposed to, if you know the habits of your boss and uh, your coworkers, you know there's ways that you can do things that bring them joy, bring them happiness, uh, whether it's turning things in early or whether it's helping them out on a project, you know what their love language is and you can help them out with those areas. You can always gain favor with it. But what are some ways that people try to gain favor with God? Uh, just as we know how to gain favor with people around us because uh, they may need help down the road, we may need help down the road. What are some ways that people try to gain favor with God? And then why do we try to gain favor with God? I know that a lot of times uh, we're just trying to find ourselves in the right standing with God. And we try all kinds of things. In different cultures, people try different ways to please God. Some people go and, and in their cultures, they offer sacrifices still, and they offer sacrifices to appease their gods. Some people go and bathe in sacred rivers and, and meditate on sacred mountain, mountains. Others bow down to statues and burn incense. Other people uh, still have their, their gods that they worship. But Paul answers this age-old question, that salvation is available only to those who call upon the name of Jesus. Our salvation is rooted in the incarnation and the resurrection of Jesus and available only through his complete work on the cross. So as we look into Romans chapter five, to, uh, chapter 10 today, starting in verse 5, Paul explains three things. He explains uh, what brings favor to God. God desires a right relationship with all humanity. God offers salvation as a means of reconciliation. And then salvation is and has always been available to all people through faith in Jesus. It's always been that way. Even, even back in the Old Testament, God's desires were for all nations to come to know him. Uh, through Abraham, it was so the nations could come and know who God is. As soon as the uh, Israelites left Egypt, guess what? A lot of the, some Egyptians left with them because they knew and trusted their God. Rahab, when it came to the town of Jericho, she says, we know about your God. And uh, if you'll save me, I will come be a part of you. And, and you, we see that people, God always has a desire for the nations to come and know who he is and for salvation for everyone. As you look through Romans, if you look at how Paul was kind of setting up, there's two real big distinct sections. Chapter 1 through 8 builds on a theology framework of what is salvation. And then chapters 12 through 16... Paul addresses <clears throat> excuse me, practical challenges of the Christian life. So there's what is salvation, but then how are we supposed to live that salvation on the, the two the extremes of the book? But chapters 9 through 11 here focus on the role of the Jews under the new covenant based on faith. So while the old covenant is based on the sacrificial system, now that Jesus has died and come back to life in this new era, how is how is how does the Israelites live? How do the Jewish communities live with the Messiah that has come? So Paul believed the original chosen people continue to have a role in God's kingdom uh, if they believed in Christ. So what we see in this text is God, is Paul taking time out as he writes to the Roman church to address some of the Jews that may be still trying to find this Christianity thing or trying to leave their Jewish uh, past behind. What do I leave behind? What do I keep from that? but also a way to minister to the Jewish community because they know about the things of God. They know about uh, uh, the law and they know about King David and they know about a Messiah that's supposed to be coming. So how can this Greek church 
help minister in this context. So as we start in chapter 10, in verse 4, actually, we talk about uh, just kind of the contrast that goes, goes along with this. It says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. But in verse 5, Paul contrasts the law and faith using the words of Moses. So as we're looking at the law, as we're looking at what Paul's trying to convey here, he pulls in Leviticus 18.5 that identifies how individuals could earn righteousness from the law. Verse 5 says in Leviticus 18, Keep my statutes and my ordinances. A person will live if he does them. I am the Lord. Then Paul also contrasts in Romans uh, 10 verses 6 through 7 using Moses' words. So that relate to the law and how they apply them to Christ. So, so let's just look at Deuteronomy real quick before we dig, dig in our text in Romans chapter 10. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 11 through 14. Give you a moment just to get there. You can pause and come right back. Deuteronomy 30 verses 11 through 14. And we're looking at what is it that God desires the Jewish people to know back before Christ. And in verse 11 it says, This command I give to you today is certainly not too difficult or beyond your reach. It is not in heaven so that you have to ask who will go up to heaven, get it for us, and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it. And it is not across the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea, get it for us, and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it. But the message is very near you. The message is very near you in your mouth, and in your heart so that you may follow it. So building upon this foundation in Romans chapter 10, starting at verse 5, I want you to pause and I want you to read through Romans 5. Read through Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14 again. Make sure you get a good feel for it, right? Anything that jumps out to you, maybe, maybe if you see any similarities between Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, maybe that's something you can kind of compare and look at those verses with it. But, but ask the group, look at the action verb. As you're reading through, look at the action verbs in verses 5 through 10 of Romans chapter 10 as Paul builds upon these foundations, okay? So pause and come right back for me. As we move on, what we see is we look in verse 5, you know, coming from the law, the one who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart, who will go up to heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will go into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you. In your mouth and in your heart, this is a message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So as we look, in verses 6 through 7, it says, Do not say in your heart, straight, a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4. Do not say in your heart, as God warns the Israelites, that when he delivers them safely into Canaan, that they are not to claim that they did it out of their own righteousness. When you go into Israel, don't say it's because of how righteous you were that you got into the, the promised land. No, it's because of how righteous God is. So, so don't say in your hearts that we did this on our own. Make sure you understand that everything that happened to you, Israel, was from God. But then, then here in Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14 that we talk about, Moses had a warning. These blessings that came through obedience and disobedience that brought curses. And he warned the people, disobeying and be punished. But you, you will disobey. You will be punished. But don't worry, God will restore you. And when he restores you, he'll circumcise your heart. He'll circumcise your heart so that you'll have a new heart to worship God with uh, when you're ready for this. And he'll impress Israel with a ready access to know who God is. He'll impress upon it upon your heart. That's what was said back in Deuteronomy. Here Paul comes back in Romans chapter 5 talking about being saved. And he says, who says that we have to go high to get Christ or we have to go down to get Christ? Just as in Deuteronomy, you have to cross the sea. He goes, the message of God is near in your mouth and in your hearts. It's right here. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you look in those, confessing with the mouth and believing in the heart are in both Romans and in Deuteronomy. 
too often times we look at this as two different steps that we got to confess and we got to believe in our heart. But Paul, I think uh, what Paul's really getting at is it's the same exact thing. It's two sides of the same coin. Uh, it's not a separate process. It's the same. If you're confessing with your mouth, what comes out of your mouth should be what's coming out of your heart. So if you're confessing Jesus with your mouth, that's because you're believing in him in your heart. So it's the same exact thing. It's not a two-step process. It's an overflow of the one-step process of believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. So, so Paul says a person gains salvation through believing and confessing. When I talk about believing, we're talking about life change. We're not just throwing out there and saying, oh, I believe in God. Oh, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I believe Jesus is my Savior. We're talking about a life change. That you confess and you believe in your heart to the point your heart's been circumcised. It's been it's created differently now. It thinks differently. Why? Because God has come in and renewed your heart through the sacrifice of Jesus. So what is the appeal of earning salvation when we can have it for free? What's the appeal of us seeking out our own righteousness to justify ourselves in the eye of God when it's just if we confess and believe it's a free gift that we have? What is it that just gives us this appeal, this desire to earn it ourselves. As we shift, though, you may need to pause, may need to jot that down and think on that question a little bit. That's a pretty good question there. Why is it that we always desire and drive ourselves to try to appease God with our own actions? And before I move on, just thought comes through my head, a lot of times we think that it was something that we had to offer. That's why God picked us for salvation. We think it's because we were so good in school or it's because of our profession or look at my skills and talents and God can really use that on his team. But in reality, God considers, as Paul would say, all that rubbish. Everything that we would look to God and offer up is, hey, this is what you can use, God, in my life. God says, nah, I just need you to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And we'll take care of the rest from there. It's not anything that we have done. It's everything that he does for us. He changes our heart and who we are. But yet we still have this appeal to earn our salvation. We still have this appeal to earn it and not accept the free gift that he gives. Knowing that even with that free gift, it cost him dearly. But then it cost our life as we move forward to grow in him. It's just nothing we can do to earn it. All right, so let's shift identifying who can receive salvation. As we look at who can receive salvation, let's read through verses 11 through 13. And uh, just pause, I want you to read through, and I want, I want you to pull out keywords. What does it say of who can receive? Now, I know in your head, you may already go, oh, everybody can receive. Where does it say it in the scripture, though? Right? We have these ideas in our head, but where does it say it in the scripture? So pause and read verses 11 through 13, and then we'll come back. I'll read it one more time for us as we look at these verses. So Paul bases this message on the words from the prophet of Isaiah in chapter 28 through six, verse 16. And Joel 2 verses 32 says that everyone, Jew and Greek, who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. And he makes his point here for the verse, for the scripture in verse 11, for the scripture says everyone, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. And since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek because the name of the Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that a great thing to know? That's not about how you were born or what tribe you were born into or what religion you were born into. But it's about who calls upon the name of Jesus. And it doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what your religious experiences are. It comes down to the fact that when Scripture says, if you call upon the name of Jesus, you will be saved. Not another God, not another Savior, but call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. As you look here, Paul makes his points. Jew and Greek have the same Lord over them. Jew and Greek have the same Lord over them. And the Lord riches, rich, richly blesses everyone who calls upon his name. He intentionally blesses everyone who calls upon his name. We look in the Old Testament of other people that come in and out of Scripture and it talks about them being a priest of the Lord like Melchizedek. And you even talk about even Jethro uh, with Moses' father-in-law. You see that people are still 
trying to understand who God is, and God is still reaching out and talking, those that call upon his name will be saved. But not everyone, not only will everyone who believes in Jesus will not be put to shame, but those who believe can call upon a gracious Lord that will bless them richly. So not only is it a, hey, come and get saved, come and be a part of God, but come and get all the blessings that go along with it. And it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek, everyone who calls upon is going to be equal amount of their blessings from God. Verse 13, one of the ways the, the writers demonstrate the deity of Jesus is that they like to put Jesus in the, the, the words that they would reserve for God in the same. So when Paul's writing, he puts here, he says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, who's the Lord in this context? Most of the time when you read Lord in the Bible, it's talking about God. But here Paul says, no, the Lord I'm referring to is Jesus, who is Lord, who is God. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. He also does that when you look in Philippians chapter 2, when it says that he will put Jesus, uh, uh, that name above every name will be, be, be Jesus. Okay, He elevates Jesus up to the God level. And he says, God is Jesus. Jesus is God. So if you call upon the name of Jesus, you'll be saved. Why? Because that, because God walked this earth. God walked this earth and made the sacrifice for us so that we may be saved. So what makes salvation through faith in Jesus being offered to all so wonderful and so difficult at the same time? What makes it, what makes salvation through faith in Jesus so easy for us to understand and grasp and so great that everyone can receive it? But what's the difficulties that go along with that as well? I want you to pause. I want you to think about that just for a moment. And while you're thinking about that, I want you also, uh, when you're done thinking about that, jot down your answers on that. Read verses 14 through 15 for me as well. Uh, and note the progression of Paul's questions there. Okay, so, so why is it difficult for us when we say everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved? Why is that, man, that sounds so great, but then when we start thinking practically how that looks, what's the difficulties that go along with it? And then as you're reading verses 14 through 15, what's the progression of Paul's questions? So pause it, come back with me, join, join back with me, and uh, let's see what, what answers you come up with. So when I sit here and think about the, the easy part, and you say everyone can come to know Christ, I'm thinking, wow, that's great, that's awesome. But then when I think of dif difficulties that go along with it, I find one that is fascinating that everyone has an opportunity to come to know Christ. I find it fascinating that it's, it's everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But the same, that difficulty is, is how do we get that message to them? The difficulty still comes of how does that look and how can we get the message that everyone can be saved to everyone? But then sometimes even in my own flesh, there's some people I don't like talking to. That doesn't mean that my mission's not the same. I don't get to pick and choose who goes to heaven, but a lot of times we do that because we like to withhold the gospel presentation because we don't like that person. A lot of times we'll sit here and we'll invest in certain people because they look like us, they smell like us, they, they talk like us, they act like us. But those that don't, well, I can focus my efforts on sharing the gospel with them. But the gospel's for everyone, and we got to break out of our comfort level of not just people that we're like, but the whole world here. So when we read in, in, in verse 14 and we look at this question, how then can they call on, on him they have not believed in? How can people... How can people know about Jesus when they haven't even heard about him? And how can they believe without hearing about him? They don't know about him because they haven't heard about him. And, and if you haven't heard about it, how can they hear without a preacher? Someone has to preach it. Someone has to go tell them. And here in this context, the preacher isn't a Tim Moffat. It's anyone who's a believer. Anyone that goes out to share the gospel, they're preaching at that moment. So it's not necessarily a specific calling. It's a general calling for all believers to evangelize. They need to hear a preacher. And how can they preach unless they are sent? But here, so if they haven't heard, how do they know who Jesus is to believe in them? And if they don't know because they haven't heard, they don't haven't heard because they have not had someone come and share the gospel with them. Someone hasn't come and share the gospel with them because the church hasn't sent people out to do that. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring 
good news. So here in the Greek words, as we go through this progression, how can people know who Christ is? How can people receive this salvation for free whenever they haven't heard it? They haven't heard it because no one's told them. No one's told them because no one's preached it to them. And no one's preached it to them because no one has sent someone to them. Hear the word beautiful when it talks about feet. And the Greek can actually be translated too as timely. Look at it this way. How timely are the feet of those who bring good news? Those who proclaim the good news and the gospel have a timely message. It's a message that people need to hear. And when you receive a timely message, one of salvation, it's a beautiful message as well. The point of the Old Testament quotes Isaiah 52, 7 and Nahum 1, 15 is to provide scriptural confirmation of the necessity of preaching, the necessity of us going out and doing missions, the necessity of us doing what we've been called to do. And Paul's saying, we are called to share with the world this great news because it is for everyone, Jews and Greeks alike, but it's for everyone that hears, which means we gotta send someone out there to tell them so they can hear it. And if we send someone out to tell them, we gotta have a church that will sponsor them and send them out. We need missionaries in the field. The church has the responsibility not only to proclaim the gospel wherever they go, but to also send people where they can't go. Their responsibility is to send it out to the world so people can hear it. That's why we have missionaries around the world. That's why we pray for people to rise up in our church, to leave our church. I know that's what you don't hear often. We want you to rise up, to leave our church, to go to a place that does not have the gospel. That to me is the mark of a biblical church and the desire of what churches should be looking at is that this should be the hub as we're sending people out into the world to share that good news. The gospel witness is sent to the world. We don't wait for people to come to the sanctuary or to church so they can hear the gospel. It's for everyone and everywhere. Yes, people can get saved when they come to church. And yes, church is a great thing for us to gather up as we share and express what God has done in our life. But the church is supposed to be a sending church. And the church is supposed to be doing mission work, whether it's in our neighborhoods, whether it's in our schools, whether it's in our workplaces, whether it's in other countries or in other states or in other areas that have not received the gospel. We don't wait for them to come to us. The the Great Commission says, go, not wait, and I'll bring them to you. Go make disciples. So what makes the feet of a person who shares the gospel beautiful? What makes the feet of a person who shares the gospel beautiful? How beautiful are the feet that share the gospel with you? How beautiful are the feet that share the gospel with maybe relatives that you have down the road? Maybe if your parents were Christians, who shared Christ with them? What's your spiritual uh, uh, genealogy? Who shared Christ with who so that you can have this great faith? So God promises to save all people, uh, all people who place their faith in his resurrected son. Salvation through faith in Jesus is available to all people. And believers must actively tell others the gospel and willingly send out missionaries to the entire world. So, as we wrap up, how would you describe your confession and belief about Jesus? How would you describe that? But also, how did you confess, how did that confession and belief change your life? What's the fruit of that? What's the result of you confessing and believing? But also, how does it change your life today? I would even dare say, more importantly, how does it change someone else's life today? because you've confessed and believed that Jesus is Lord and has been raised from the dead, how is it that that changes the people around you? And if not, how is it you need to allow it to change other people around you? So as we pray, I wanna encourage you, offer uh, commitments for our daily lives. And I know that in this time of us not being around people, maybe this is a great opportunity for us to sit and reflect without the distractions of the world around us and sit and reflect about the gift of salvation that we have. Maybe this is an opportunity while we are homebound that we sit and reflect 
about all the things that we could have been doing but neglected to do when we were out and about. And I pray and ask that that's a passion that's burning in our heart. So when the doors are open, when we're released to go back in the community, we don't go back to the old way. And I know that's what everyone's screaming. We're just ready for things to get back to normal. Maybe we should be praying, God, what is it you don't want to be normal? God, what is it that you want us to move forward with and do that we've neglected in our old normal? God, how can you use us for a timely message of the gospel whenever we are allowed to go out and share? But you know what? We can still share on Facebook. We can still share with our neighbors. As I've mentioned in my, my hope moments, right? We can be prayer walking. We can be working on our testimony. And even this past Monday, we can be we can be talking about how we can tell Bible stories to people in our neighborhood as we go. So have that mindset already. God, how can we use this time for us to reflect, to get focused? So we're not worried about the things that we've been neglecting. We're worried about the things you've called us to do and you've called us to refocus so that we can be the ones with a timely message, with the beautiful feet to go and share the good news. Thanks for joining me. Y'all have a blessed day. See you tomorrow in church on Facebook Live. Father God, I do thank you for today. Oh, I thank you for your son, Jesus, and all that he did, Father. How he's changed my life. How he changes the lives of people around me. But Father, I pray and ask that it's not just about my life being changed. It's about my life being changed that can now help change other people's lives. Help us to focus on others. Help us to focus on bringing that good news so that people, people's lives can be changed, whether they're Jew or Greek, whether they're from a different tribe from us or not, whether they're a different color than we are, but Father, whether they come from a different socioeconomical background. Father, whether we just don't like them or we call them our enemies or we call them our friends, let us share the good news of Christ with everyone. In your name we pray and ask it. Amen. God bless.